الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي جمعنا وياكم في هذا اليوم المبارك نتلقى الرحمات الإلهية والبركات الربانية ونتواصل بالحق والصبر ونأخذ الاقتداء والاهتداء بالنبي المصطفى محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم Alhamdulillah, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He allowed us and facilitated us for us all to gather on this blessed day in seeking the divine outpourings and that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to give to those who return to Him. The, the Prophet sallallahu the source of all this blessing, He was the one that Allah made and designed to be the source of all of His wrath. And Allah taught us, within, uh, informed us in the Quran, We have not sent you except as a as perfect compassion to all, all the worlds, all realms of existence. So the teachings of the Beloved وسلم, is the essence and the source of all forms of true happiness in this life and the next. And Allah made or decreed that this life is temporal it, it's limited we have a limited amount of time and then we transition into an internal reality and each one of these planes of existence or experiences of different realities and realms each one the, as, the, as they continue they become longer and more uh, more eternal And every life or every plane or realm of existence has, is, is happier than the one before. And every life or experience of existence uh, has the capacity built in within it to experience things on a much deeper level than the one prior to it. So one of these dimensions of our existence as human beings, we exist within the wounds of our mothers. This is a, a limited period of time. It's a specified period of time and it has a limited and particular experience. After which, after which, moving from transitioning from this dimension, this plane of existence within the mother's womb, we enter into Hayat al Dunya, the realm of the uh, ephemeral world, the dunya. Typically, a human lifespan can be around its, its normative limits are around 90 years of age. However, the Prophet said, the The normative lifespan of my ummah is between 60 and 70 years of age, years old. So this is very different from the nine months which we've spent in the wombs of our mothers. And the, the experiences that a person can have whilst in the world are more elated, they're more palpable, they're, more, they're deeper. And then we transition to another dimension known as the life of the barzakh, the intermediary stage. This is an unknown phase for all of us. Normatively, people are frightened because they're frightened of the unknown. But the people that are illuminated, they understand the nature of these transitions to these various dimensions and realms within our existence 
that if a person does good, that they're entering into a more elated, a deeper, a more profound, palpable experience. so after the transitioning from the life of this world, the dunya, the ephemeral world, we move on to in the barzakh and after this you have a particular marhala or a particular phase which is transitional on the way to Yom Qiyamah. And excuse me, on the way to Jannah, paradise or hell. And this is comprises of multiple dimensions, but this is where the first stage of the implications of one's actions whilst in this world, world start to manifest. Those people that believed in the messengership of all of the prophets, then their experience starts to, to become very different for those people which denied them. <laughs> So upon this transition there are, there are people that are able to apprehend this whilst within this life. There are archetypes of believers which are so illuminated and conscious that through means of a dreams or some other kind of disclosure they're able to see or perceive something of that domain or dimension that they get to transition to. Some people they can see or experience, taste something of the life of, life of the Barzakh. Some people they're able to even taste something of that pa paradisal realm which takes place. And this is also mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ said that the one that prays four units of prayer, four rak'ats, within each of them you recite 50 times Surah Ikhlas, Qul huwa Allahu Ahad, on the night of Jum'ah, that you don't die or you don't transition to the next life other than you're able to see your space in Jannah. So this narration from the Prophet ﷺ is weak in terms of, it, of its veracity of, of its center, its chain of generation. However, in terms of the reality of its effects, anybody that's tried this, it's tried and tested, they've indeed seen this. And witnesses in their dreams. So in terms of the, the nomenclature, the, the science of the hadith, even if it's weak in terms of its authority of narration, its veracity in terms of narration, it doesn't mean it's weak in terms of its reality that the prophetism didn't necessarily say this thing. So you could say like, almost like the, the spiritual physics of these domains and dimensions which are yet to come. Allah's made it, He's ordained it, He's designed it that it's a place where only bliss is experienced. It's designed to experience the deepest level of the realities of true happiness. And this can take place in the barzakh, this intermediate true stage, and ultimately it's the most elated form in that later on paradisal stage. The nature of the dunya, this ephemeral world which we're all existing now, Allah did not design it to be a place where a person is constantly happy, where things are designed, the physicality of this world is not able to cradle um, that which makes a person, the soul of a person truly happy. This is which 
coming to takes place after we transition into the next life. So, because of our limited intellect and capacity to understand, we're not able to really approximate or grasp the nature of the profundity of what's awaiting us in the next life. So, what we do is we align our belief and our iman to that of the enbiya which we trust and the, because of their absolute truthfulness that that which they inform us upon we align to this and we believe it and this is what, what the reality of Iman and the epoch of the, the era in which we live in currently is, is, the, is literally the end times we're literally at the end or the final cusp of the end of the world and we believe this through the, 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 the verified affirmation directly from the Prophet this isn't just philosophizing this isn't some kind of you know, spurious scientific theory this is from the words of the Messenger of Allah <laughs> Similarly we're informed that at the cusp of the end times there is a, a, a spread of vast tribulation, all forms of strange and unknown fitness. However the Prophet he informed us of this and he informed us of the ways and the methodology of how to face them and succeed and traverse through them. So the great Imam Bukhari ta'ala, went into a meticulous detail in decompartmentalizing all the various expressions and forms that this fitna, this tribulation would take. The fitna or the tribulation which pertains to a person on an individual level. The fitna of one's family that can, can afflict one's family, one's society. And all of the various things and situations and scenarios which will take place at, to the Ummah of the Prophet وسلم, at the end times. So in the stage of things, certain of some of these pre-told fitness, these, these tribulations and calamities, will kind of almost be cloudy at the beginning. You won't be able to understand what they truly are. But as time goes by, it will be, become clearer and clearer that this is exactly what the Prophet is referring to and therefore we'll know how to deal with them. So the Prophet وسلم, literally laid out of laid out to his ummah all of these ways out, these channels in order to succeed from being uh, inundated by all these fitness. One of them that the Prophet وسلم, one of his channels that the Prophet وسلم, mentioned was to be completely immersed in the Book of Allah, in the Qur'an. And Habib Qadim then went on to say there's a caveat to this. It doesn't mean somebody that just suffices with the outward utterance, but somebody who's deeply reflected and really engages and immerses themselves in the reality of the Qur'an. Somebody that may be reciting the Qur'an, but it may uh, be deficient in terms of its strength on the heart and how it, how it guards a person in, in protection from these things. So the Prophet 
أغطية من الانشغالات من الانشغال بهذه الحياة هذه الأغلفة المعنوية على القلوب تجعلنا لا نسمع القرآن ونقرأه لكن لا يقر في قلوبنا بحيث أننا نأخذه ثم نفهم المراد من المراد الله عز وجل So Allah tells us explicitly that he place, places like a veil or a, a covering over the hearts of those that don't have Iman. Now this is somebody that is, is in the state of Kufr. However, a similar thing can pertain to the believers if they don't have due reverence and truly immerse themselves in the reality of the, the Qur'an. They can read it on a superficial level, but there are degrees to unveiling and consciousness in the realities of the Qur'an. Only those that delve deeper and deeper and bring it upon themselves to truly immerse themselves in the Qur'an will be uh, sufficiently protected. now, excuse me, just continuing on from the previous episode, Habib Qadim said this can happen to the believers because of our many distractions, the nature of the world is we are constantly distracted. One of the most powerful ways to eliminate or traverse through these distractions is to read the Quran specifically in the night. And specifically in the depths of the night, Akhir layl in the last portion of the night. Why? Because the nature of the mind is it's much clearer. It's, there are less distractions. During our day, you may have an argument with such and such a person. You may have a distraction. You may be preoccupied by earning a living. There are many, many distractions which take place, particularly in the times in which we live in. So to appoint that specific period of time in the night, to really deeply engage with the Qur'an, really bring to heart and bring to mind the nature and the reality of the Qur'an, this is one of the things that starts to slowly but surely <coughs> move off these veils so the person can have a true deepening engagement with the reality. <laughs> بضوابطها شرعية مثل الاعتزال لكن بضوابط اتباع سنة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بضوابط من أهم مخارج الفتن في آخر الزمان التي تشمل الكل القرآن الذي يكون للخواص التي تشمل الكل الاكتداء بالشيوخ الصالحين والارتباط بالأولياء العارفين هذا إذا ارتبط الشباب والشباب بالشيوخ العارفين المنورين الأولياء الواصلين هم محفوظين من الفتن مهما تحصل من الفتن يكونون في حفظ أنهم مربوطين بهؤلاء سلاسل النبي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم Salasul Islam al said that there are many forms, many expressions of these channels, these ways out, literally almost like an emergency exit. Like you have in a building, there's an emergency exit. And the Prophet taught us that if you're in this time, this era, that there are emergency exits. Now we mentioned with the Quran, but sometimes this can only take place for the elect of the Ummah, people that have an ability and a consciousness to really deepen the meanings within the Qur'an. However, that which is a general um, way out or a channel in order to be protected and illuminated and preserve this consciousness and want to Iman is to be connected to those people who are illuminated. And these people are the shuq, the true authorized teachers of this tradition with unbroken chains and threads of light that have centered all the way back to the Prophet Wasallam. The awliya, the people that have a deep insight into the realities of these things in connecting your heart in connecting your practice and connecting your way to this archetype of human being is one of the greatest forms of protection for the fitness of the end times. <laughs> So Habib said just to emphasize that we're talking, this is for the generality of, of Muslims. This isn't something for specific groups of people. The greatest, most open doorway, if you like, is to connect to those people that are illuminated. Because if a person slips or they fall in the nature of the fitna because of their spiritual insight, they're able to grab this person and stand them back up on their own two feet. Oh, 
نفعنا الله وياكم بهم ونواب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الموجودين في امه النبي صلى الله عليه واله وصحبه وسلم في مشارق الارض ومغاربها هم الذين يرسمون للناس طرق السلامه طرق النجاه كيف يسلمون من الفتن التي تكون في اخر الزمان بشرط حسن ارتباطهم بهؤلاء الشيوخ النورانيين الاولياء الذين عندهم الانوار الخارقه كيف يرتبطون بهم فتحصل لهم السلامه من الفتن الصغيره والفتن الكبيره الفتن الكبيره التي تقدم على الامه الخطيره فتن الدين والعياذ بالله الالحاد والارتداد هذه الفتن الخطيرة الذي لم يرتبط الإنسان إما بالقرآن ارتباط كامل أو بالرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم أو بالشيوخ الصالحين فعندما تداهمه الفتن قد يتزعزع وقد يتشقق وقد يتزلزل لكن ارتباطه يكون أمان وضمان له في المشي الحقيقي على طريق النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى طريق النجاة في الدنيا من الفتن وفي الآخرة كذلك من العذاب والمشاكل. So this archetype of human being, these great shiuch, these authorized spiritual guides that have that have this chain of narration, this chain of light, all the way back to the Prophet Sallallahu This is the greatest way for people to connect to them. And we find this in, in, in all expressions, all different forms, all different uh, manifestations of these various, sometimes very elusive forms of tribulation and trial. They have the plan. They have the, dis- like the blueprint because of who they are by implication. They're awliya. They have an insight and they have a deep knowledge that they're able to see this and place it upon a person and see how to navigate their way out of this particular fitna which we may perform befallen a person and lead them back to the road of peace and the road of safety. So once again to reiterate this is a time in which we're, we're all inhabiting which is absolutely the time which the Prophet ﷺ informed us about is the end times and we can see this, we can observe this through that which he taught and that which you can observe in the world around us. كل الناس كانت في هذه المصيبة التي هي قد تكون سبب لأخطاء الناس أخطوا وتقديراتهم الشريرة فأوقعت الناس كلهم في هذا. And these uh, manifestations of these forms of tribulation, it it's in terms of that which is specific to a particular region or a place, or it could be global. Just as we've seen in in, in recent times with this great tribulation that which has been referred to as Corona, this is something which we see. In many ways, some of the first time an expression on a global level, something with such an intensity, and people didn't know how to deal with it. And there's many, many challenges how we interact with it. This is one of the expressions of these, uh, this fitna, this tribulation, which the Prophet mm-hmm. informed us about, and it starts to take place in the end times. <laughs> بسيط وأثر يسير فقط ولكن ليس ذو خطير ذو أمر خطير تعلق ببواطنهم وبعقولهم وبأديانهم بسبب الاتباع للشيوخ هذا مثال. So given this example, if you look in retrospect, those people that were not connected to these spiritual guides in this this way, irrespective of on the individual basis or in terms of groups or organizations, those people that that were severed from this light, look at the way that they dealt with this particular fitna. Typically, they, 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 they fell flat in their face and they came into major problems. Those people that were connected, and if you review this in retrospect to the shiuch, to the awliya, to those authorized spiritual guides, it, it passed by them in somewhat in, in a gentle way. And, and we go back to, I was going to say new norm, but we go back to a normative way of being. في بلاد العراق كما قال صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وسلم من انحسار نهر الفرات وشحت المياه هناك فينحسر فيظهر جبل من ذهب فيتكتل الناس عليه فالرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم حذر من الآن هذا يسمونه التحذير الاستباقي قبل ما يحصل قد حذر الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم قال فمن كان بعيدا فلا يرحل إليه ومن كان قريبا فلا يأخذ منه شيء فتنا ستظهر محدودة 
في في زمن محدد وستنتهي وفي بلاد محدده وستنتهي والنصوص موجوده من الرسول والحلول موجوده من الرسول لا تسافر لا ترحل حتى لو كانت التذاكر ميزانيه حتى لو كانت الخطوط مفتوحه لا تسافر ابدا امكث في مكانك من كان قريبا فلا ياخذ منه شيء اذا انت في هذا المكان لا تاخذ اي شيء وان كنت بعيد لا ترحل فانها ستنتهي في مده محدده وسيتوضح بعد ذلك الغرض من اظهار هذه الفتن للناس. So the example of Corona is one example. Another example that we, we can perhaps observe that we're on the, the cusp of this starting to take place is what the Prophet specifically informed us about that the Euphrates, the Euphrates River will start to run dry. And he gave a, a prescribed way or solution of how to deal with this. If you're far away from, from this land, don't go to it, don't travel to it. If you're already in close proximity to it, don't take from the river. Now, how rationally, how is this going to work? Do we observe this right now? Habib Karim said that there'll come a time and this, these things will start to become more and more apparent. And the prescription was already there. It was pre-prescribed by the Prophet ﷺ himself about how to deal with this. And then that particular fitna will pass on and it will manifest and you know, transition into another form another set of events but this is particularly the prescription how an example of how to deal with it as prescribed by the prophet sallallahu for this particular expression of fitna then min aham asbab al najal ummat an nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi wa sallam ala mukhtalif darajatha in kanu nisa wa in kanu rijal wa in kanu fi mayadin al ilm wa in kanu fi mayadin al a'mal aw al tijara aw al zira'ah aw al sana'ah min aham أطباق النجاة لهم والسلامة الارتباط بالشيوخ الصالحين فأنه إذا حصل الارتباط بالأولياء والصالحين وحسن الظن فيهم واعتقاد أن كلامهم هو الصواب أصوب حتى من كلام الإعلان وما ينشر في القنوات لأن هذا كلام الصالحين مأخوذ من كلام النبي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم بينما كلام الإعلان مصنوع وصنع لعدة طرق تحصل للمرتبط أقل شيء ثلاث فصال irrespective men women young old no matter what kind of profession you're in what kind of if you're in farming if you're in a, any form of profession the ultimate way out or the ultimate source of safety is an authentic true connection back to those authorized spiritual guides why because they are only that they've only become that archetype because of their meticulous following of the teachings and the light to the prophet sallallahu himself we follow then because they follow him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tahsil al-murtabat thalath khasar istamar al-akhmusab ma'ala dhan la'annu fi fatwa lil-shafi'i al-sagheer اسمه سيدنا الإمام الحبيب بحمد بن زيد الحبشي قال إذا أذن المؤذن وأنتم في عمل ذكر أو في خير فقال كله خير يعني فليس كما يقول بعض الفقهاء لابد من ترك الخير لأجل إجابة المؤذن والفقه واسع يعني لا يمثل لا يمثل الإسلام فقيه واحد ولا مذهب واحد دين الله أوسع من المذاهب ومن الفقهاء هم يأخذون من بحر الدين يعني. So Habib Kalim said you're going to notice now we're going to keep on talking and that even when the event goes off because one of the positions authentic positions is if you're in the middle of something which is khayr of religious um, benefit you keep on doing it and the nature of the vast spectrum and diversity within the different schools and authorized madahib is that we can take from this when the appropriate time and the appropriate moment is needed so this is the reason in case any of you are wondering why we're going to continue going on so then Habib Kadami said one of the three things come primarily from following the shiuch أقل ما يحصل للمرتبط بالشيوخ في زمان الفتن ثلاث خصال وهي مهمة جدا تحصل هذه الثلاث خصال وكل واحدة أهم من التي قبلها. So these three primary traits which it's the least it, that can happen it's one of the three things that are destined to happen you can say in connecting to these authorized spiritual guides each one of them as you proceed through them they're going to be more important than the previous one. فأن الشيوخ يعني بتعليماتهم النورانية يحسنون تطبيق كلام النبي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم so وأيضا يكون فهمهم صحيح لمراد النبي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم هذا يفهم من هذا الحديث كذا هذا يفهم كذا وكذا فيحصل اختلاف ما هو الفهم الصحيح الفهم الصحيح لهذا كذا وكذا وكذا So the, the shiuch because of their training and because of their inheritance they have a, have a meticulous insight and you could say a perfection in their understanding of the teachings of the Prophet 
the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, in how this translates situationally and, pra- and practically how we do these things. And this is why when we take from their example, in, in what we're doing is we're taking from the, the most perfect translation of the reality of those teachings from the Quran and the Sunnah. so the first uh, trait or you could say thing that the person takes in their connection back to uh, the shiuch is that they're free from spilling blood and what that means is you have no participation whether physically or even in just in one's words in, in being associated by in killing or in oppression from those things which are not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the, this you could have you Khan said this is a consensus amongst the the great spiritual guides and trainers of this tradition irrespective whether they're Ba'alubi or Naqshbandi or Shadili all of the authorized authentic schools of thought that you'll notice towards the end of time that they're very very serious about warning their those people that, that, that follow their way to engage in spilling blood without due right. يكون له كثير كبير على الناس في اتخاذ قراراتهم في الحياة يما كلام سلبي ظلماني يؤثر وما كلام نوراني رباني يؤثر كذلك فتسلم ألسنتهم من الخوف في الباطل ومن الخوف فيما يخوض الناس فيه وربما ترتب على الكلام شرور ومفاسد وبلايا والعياذ بالله So the second quality that a person attains in connecting to the shiuch is that you have safety of the tongue and what that means is your speech now becomes uh, protected and we live in a time where speech and, and communication has probably more effect than it ever it has done it's influential somebody could say one thing and it affects a person's lifestyle it affects a person's behavior it affects a person's uh, decisions that they take so this is one of the things that if you connect to the the, the, the sound spiritual guides because they talk with it literally the tongue of prophecy an illuminated speech an illuminated tongue and if you're connected to that, that starts to pervade onto your speech, onto your tongue. You have a tongue, tongue which is now conscious, which is now illuminated. And it's free from degradation or looking down upon people or cursing people or speaking in a way which is derogatory, which is the complete opposite of the prophetic way. <laughs> The third trait is that and it's linked to this protection of, of one's ability, of, of one's speech, one's tongue, is the protection, literally, the verbatim translation, one's limbs, and your actions, your hands, your whatever you, you do with your body. Because, as the Prophet Sussam alluded to in the hadith, that the, the limbs follow the tongue. So your verbal communication has a direct impact in your action. والأمر الثالث وهو كذلك مهم جدا أنه بحسن ارتباطه بالشيوخ في كل الطرق الصوفية مع العلم والذكر وغير ذلك يسلمون قلب المريد هذا وقلب المرتبط بهذه السلاسل النورانية من الهم فيكون قلبه كذلك محفوظ انظروا في جائحة كورونا وما سيأتي بعد ذلك في حوادث العالم هذا من الأراجيف التي ينشرها الشيطان أراجيف ترجف الناس وتقلق قلوبهم تحفظ قلوبهم من الهم 
فيكون محفوظا من الهموم لانهم ماذا؟ لانهم يجرعون القلب هذا معاني الطمانينه بواسطه ذكر الله، معاني الرضا بالقضاء والقدر، معاني الاستسلام، معاني التفويض، كلها صفات نورانيه يهدى بها الباطن ويرتاح بها القلب مهما حصل حوله من الاراجيف لا يبالي ابدا القلب داخل مطمئن، بعض الناس بالعكس قبل ان يحصل اي شيء القلب مضطرب، القلب قلق، القلب خايف، قبل ان يحصل شيء فكيف اذا حصل شيء؟ والبعد حتى إذا حصلت الأشياء فالقلب مطمئن بأنوار ذكر الله تعالى ومطمئن بأنوار صفات النبي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. So excuse me, the related to the action, this is almost like a part B to the second point. Your actions follow the tongue, and this is related to the second trait which takes place of those people that follow those authorized spiritual guides. The third of which is that you become protected from what in Arabic is called hem, which is like an angst or a worry. And anxiety, which is one of the characteristics of the age in which we live in. People that have that authentic connection because it's related back to that illuminated way, that illuminated presence, that illuminated methodology of the Prophet وسلم, you'll find that they're protected. And we see this in the lights of recent events, that which we refer to as Corona, is that there are people that were truly connected to Shuk, that they have this, um, uh, this, this, this displacement where, they're, where they are uh, at peace with those things and they're able to navigate and deal with these things around them. The opposite of which is if you're seven and you don't have this channel back to Noor and back to this light, is that even sometimes you'll find prior to something happening, just the threat or the concern of something, it may potentially happen, people are in a default state of angst and worry and concern and anxiety. Mm-hmm. So what, and have you kind of said, what, what's their state going to be like if actually something real does happen? Well, أن هذه الحقائق تنمو في الإنسان نموا معنويا ولا يشعر بها كما ينمو بدنه ولا يشعر بنمو البدن ولا بطول الشعر ولا بالأظافر فكذلك بركة الارتباط بالشيوخ مع الذكر لله والعلم وتصفية الباطن يحصل هذا النمو للصفات النورانية تدريجيا من الطمانينة والقضاء والقدر حتى يصل الإنسان إلى درجات عالية المسلم في هذه الصفات. So Habib said one way to view it is the way you feel the effect of this connection, it may not be apparent, or you may not be able to even observe it. And Habib made the similitude, it's just like when your hair or your nails grow. You're not conscious of them growing because it, it happens over a period of time and it's steady. Similarly is, is the effect on the heart and the illum- these illuminated attributes, literally sifat nuraniya, Habib Qadim mentioned. These are, these are attributes within the heart which start to grow and become cultivated you're not aware of, but after a period of time, you'll start to realize that you're free of that angst, you're free of that worry, you're free of that anxiety, and this is part of that, the reality of this inner connection back to these illuminated beings. So once again, to reiterate, this archetype of people that connect truly to the, the sound illuminated uh, scholars and awliya, that their hearts are cultivated with peace, tranquility, serenity, and this is something very different from what we may witness from other people, even facing the exact same set of circumstances. And the examples of how this transpires practically in terms of people's lives are, 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 are plenty. Were we to read the books of Tasawwuf and spirituality and the stories of these great people that had cultivated within them these great spiritual attributes. So one of the examples is, is in the commentary of the aphorisms, uh, the Hikam ibn al that he that in the commentary of one of these things, he talked in one of these in, in, in this book. He talks about one of the tyrannical rules at the time that oppressed one of these illuminated awliya. So he arranged or facilitated an, uh, a prison for this particular person, threw him in it, starved a ferocious lion, and then let him loose on this wali within the prison. So they, they geared everything up and they set the entire situation and literally let, let the, the line loose on this sheikh and this great wali. So 
And this tyrant in all of his kind of entourage and his, you know, the courtiers, courtiers, they looked on in anticipation of, of what's going to take place. In expectation, this lion is just going to rip into the sheikh. So, so he let the lion loose at the time when the sheikh was in the middle of prayer. He was praying, and that, that's when he thought it was a good moment, we're going to let the lion loose. So the, the sheikh wasn't even conscious of what was taking place and the lion it raced up to him but immediately sat down and the word that used Rabad in Arabic it literally means the lion lay down on its on its tummy and just started to lick the, the, the feet of the sheikh just like it was a little kitten until the sheikh just completed in complete serenity the end of his prayer the tashahid the final tashim and the lion was there just like a little kitten next to and obviously like this tyrannical ruler and his old entourage they're looking on like what is going on they find it, they're looking on onto this until the, the man continued and finished his prayer. So the first thing he asked the sheikh is like, what are you? What's going on? He goes, we, we set a, lion, a hungry lion loose on you and you didn't move a muscle, you just remained in the prayer. And he goes, and he didn't even fear, and he goes, I fear nothing other than Allah. He goes, yeah, but like, really, how can you not fear a ferocious lion? And just consider carefully how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thrusts this deep spiritual serenity in the depths of people. So after this, this thrusting of this deep spiritual tranquility and serenity in the heart of the sheikh, he said, okay, that's one thing. But what were you thinking about when this lion was approaching? So the, the tyrant was saying, what was going to be your mind when this was taking place? He goes, you want the truth? When the line came close to me, I was thinking, are any of the scholars, did they permit that, it, that, that saliva of a lion is permiss- is, is nedges or not? Like, I don't, it's just going to break my prayer right now. That's the only thing I was really bothered about at that particular moment. So, look at this, it's a real story. It's a real thing. Look how Allah can thrust this deep spiritual reality of serenity into the hearts of those people whom He loves. So in what's narrated one of the early biograph- biographical references is that one of the uh, one of the believers was fighting alongside the great Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib and a group of the believers were looking on and they were fighting these the kuffar and one of the kuffar took his sword and smashed it so hard again it knocked his this man saw that was fighting alongside Sayyidina Ali out of his hand onto the floor. The man immediately towered on top of him ar- about to strike. But one of the things that was so apparent and noticeable, everyone was looking on, 
is the man who's just like completely relaxed, he's just like looking up as if nothing was about to take place. <laughs> So this man just like raised his sword up just to frighten the man, like, I'm going to kill you. But the people looking on, they described the man, he just sat like quietly and just started to smile, looking at the sword going straight for him. So, in the last moment, just when the man was about to strike in the Sahabi was just looking up, smiling, an arrow came out of nowhere and took the neck of the man and he fell, fell to the ground. So the man t took the sword back, retrieved the sword back, finished off the other guy and started to fight. Afterwards, the people around him, they said, like, we saw what just happened. Because what was going through your mind when this, when this took place? He said, if you really want to know, I was just contemplating. So Allah gonna, I was thinking, what does Allah want from me right now? What's Allah going to decree for me? Is he going to take me as a martyr, as a shaheed? Or am I going to carry on fighting these kuffar and getting bored in that way? This is what we're going to be. <laughs> so, to summarize, the, the, the rule here is every single one of their entire affairs is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is an expression of how Allah helps those people that connect to him. And this happened in the battle of Uhud to the Sahaba. When the, the, the fighting became intensified. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the Sahaba to become so tranquil they started to fall asleep. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused them to become dreary. They were falling in their sleep. It's the most intense part of the battle, but Allah causes serenity. They were so tranquil. Sayyidina Talha, he said, we became so tired and relaxed. Like my sword dropped from my hand. I only realized that my sword like, dropped out of my hand. They were in this complete state of ecstasy and serenity. And to such an extent that Allah reminded them of this within the Quran that when things started to become intensified, that we, 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 we called this serenity and sleepiness to pervade over you, to put you in a place of tranquility. Also, it's mentioned in, in Surah Al Imran when Allah reminds them of this situation which took place on the battlefield that we cause some of them to fall into this kind of like peaceful dreariness and this, this, this serenity and Allah reminded that there were those amongst you Habib Qalim said the tafsir of this verse it, it references the non-Muslims and even some of those people that were kind of concerned and they, 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 were, they were from amongst the, uh, the hypocrites and those people that had very weak iman when they looked upon this and they were disturbed by it but the people of iman that fought alongside them they're the ones that experienced this serenity so 
يقول سبحانه وتعالى إذ يغشاكم النعاس أمانة منه ثم أنزل بعد ثم أنزل عليكم بعد الغم أمانة نعاسا إيه أمان طنين لكم بدأ الله في بلوهم الأمان وثمانا فيعني بعض الناس إذا أصابهم رق أو لم يأتهم النوم فيقرر هاي الملايتين فهنا مباشرة سبحانه so Habib Khalim says for this reason is actually a, a spiritual reality which is contained within these two particular verses that some of the scholars and the, the great people of insight they say if a person is stricken with insomnia they can't sleep at night then you recite these two verses and it allows you to fall into sleep and the meaning of this is when you become stricken with a kind of dreariness this is eminent and it's a form of safety it wasn't that they would become unaware or unconscious they were unable to fight the enemy but it's a form of, of, of tranquility that Allah caused to um, make the hearts firm of uh, the Sahaba so if a person is stricken with insomnia they're not able to sleep properly that they recite these two particular verses of Quran and it has the spiritual effect of causing them to fall into a peaceful and blessed sleep <laughs> So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah protects us and guards us our, our hearts, our bodies, our souls and every part of us and our loved ones and our families from all expressions of so all manifestations we ask Allah, Allah protects us from them and guards us from them whether it's to do with our individual circumstances or our families or our loved ones or it's something which is situational, circumstantial or something which takes place like we have with corona some, some kind of disease which pervades all of mankind we ask Allah that Allah so Sayyidina Ka'ab al-Ahbar he said to this meaning that were Allah literally caused the skies to collapse down onto earth Allah would have found a way out an exit strategy for a person of taqwa a person of true God consciousness for this reason all we concern ourselves with that God consciousness and Allah will find a way out for us no, we're going to say the circumstances وقول سيدنا كعب الأحبار كعب الأحبار هذا ما أخذ من قول المولى سبحانه وتعالى ومن يتق الله يجعل له مخرجا ويرزقه من حيث لا يحتسب ومن يتوكل على الله فهو حسبه إن الله بالغ أمره قد جعل الله لكل شيء قدرا هذه الآية يقول علم الصالحون ربنا عز وجل ممكن يزيل الكون كله لأجل المؤمن هذا إذا كان وقع ممكن يغير أي شيء الحق عز وجل لأجل هذا المؤمن إذا كان يكثر من هذه الآية ومن يتق الله يجعل له مخرجا ويرزقه من حيث لا يحتسب ومن يتوكل على الله فهو حسبه إن الله بليغ أمره أول بركة من بركات تكرار هذه الآية أربعين مرة كل يوم أو عشرين مرة أو خمسة وعشرين مرة أول بركة من بركاتها وأول مخرج من المخارج الرزق ومن يتق الله يجعل له مخرجا فليس قال ويشفيهم كان مريض أو يعلمه كان جاهل أو يخشف قربه كان مهموم أو كان كذا أول خصلة قال ويرزقهم من حيث لا يحتسب ثم تأتي بعد الرزق شفاء الأمراض دفع الآفات دولوغ الأمنيات بركة هذه الآية العظيمة سيدنا الأخبار والأحبار سيدنا كعب الأخبار he said this in relation this is a commentary of the verse in the Quran ومن يتق الله يجعله مخرجا ويرزقه من حيث لا يحتسب and as for the one that has this true God consciousness, taqwa, يَجْعَلُهُ مَخْرَجَ Allah makes literally an exit strategy, a channel, a way out for him. From what? From anything. The circumstances, any challenge, any problem, any calamity. وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ And provides or gives this risk, this sustenance, from whence he least expects. And Habib Qadim said, this is one of the things that the scholars say, that if a person recites this, Consistently, and one of the recommendations of Habib Qadim is to do this 40 times a day. If we can recite this verse 40 times a day, you'll find that the effects of this verse in, in, in one's openings in, across the board, within one's life and within one's situation and circumstances. And the first thing that you'll feel tangibly is Allah says, So before a person, if they're sick, you become cured. If you're ignorant, you become uh, knowledgeable. If you're in a difficult situation, it becomes souls for you. Before all of this, this is actually a bonus. This is the secondary. Allah provides from you and grants you a sustenance in every single form, inwardly and outwardly, when it's monetary, whether it's spiritual. 
from whence you least expect. So you don't even know what's coming to you from the greatness of this unlocking and this of this great verse. You just recite it, and these things start to become healed. فينبغي يعني المسلم والمسلمة في هذا الزمان الذي فيه كثير من المشوشات وكثير يعني من أسباب ال 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 الهموم للمسلمين وكذلك في هذا الزمان الذي يه بعض الأمور لا تتيسر بسرعة ما تتيسر بصعوبة مثل الزواج ومثل بعض الأمور لا تتيسر بسرعة ينبغي المسلم أن يعني يتخذ له وردا من هذه الآية الشريفة العظيمة وإن شاء الله كبيرة جدا ومن يتقل الله يجعل له مخرزة ويرزقه من حيث لا يحتسب ومن يتوقع الله فهو حزبه إن الله بالغ أمره قد جعل الله لكل شيء قدره يتخذ له وردا حتى لو كانت أموره ميسرة وكل شيء كما نقول عندنا في حضر موت كل شيء تمام أموره طيبة يتخذ ورش من هذه الآية عشرين مرة أو أربعين مرة فإذا حصل أي شيء ثم كرر هذه الآية مباشرة يكشفه الله سبحانه وتعالى فتكون حتى من باب الاحتياط يعني سو حبيب سيد He'd, he'd recommend this particularly for people in this time that you should make this a will you should make this a continuous spiritual practice of yours work it into your day work it into your practice and Habib said even like you were saying the is if it's, even if it's all good if like, things are going well do it because it will grant a deepening of one's openings and expand. Habib said for an example of somebody who needs to get married this is something you should do this will you should do this spiritual practice in order to facilitate marriage and, and whatever else that you need in your worldly affairs or the affairs of the unseen or the next life. So this is an important will to, 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 to recite this particular verse uh, frequently. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He grants us enabling grace and, and, and allows us to benefit in the most powerful of ways. And Allah protects and guards the Ummah of Islam in the East and the West from all forms and expressions of fitna in Rudina. And that Allah allows to be to become means and conduits to guidance and elevations and accent uh, uh, and the ascensions. ويجعل إن شاء الله هذه الدورات وقيام الذكر قيام آخر الليل وجميع المجالس هذه أسباب للفرج من الله حتى يأتي الفرج سبب كبيرة لأن ينزل الفرج من الله سبحانه وتعالى. إن الله makes the lights of this dora that's taking place and everything that you're doing, everything you're performing, praying in the depths of night, the night may Allah make it a means to unlock the outpouring of that heals the Ummah and remedies the Ummah and causes all of these calamities to be lifted. Because the true scholars and the, the shiuch, the righteous shiuch, they pray for the entire Ummah. They don't just pray for the people of the country they're from or their friends or their family, they pray for the entire Ummah. So, and one of the reasons for this is their spiritual acumen, they understand what's going on. If you pray for just the people of the country you're from, you attain something of the spiritual blessing and the reward in accordance with the amount of people you've prayed for. If you pray for the entire ummah, then you get rewarded for every single individual, which is vastly more expansive, that you've just prayed for. وندعو يعني لأقاربنا بالخصوص بالاسم نذكرهم بالاسم اللهم هدي فلان وشرح صدر فلان وفر فلان And we make a specific and particular dua for those people that we know and our close family and relatives by mentioning by name Oh Allah guide and bless such and such a person, this person, that person, mention them by name. And look at the reciprocal effect of making dua for other people. Look at the dua. The, the Prophet وسلم, taught us if you make dua for other people, it has a vast spiritual effect. Where he said in a hadith which is narrated by Tabarani and others, that the one that asks Allah for the forgiveness of the believing men and the believing women 27 <coughs> times a day, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this person of the archetype that their du'as are consistently answered. 
ومعنى هذا كان من الذين استجيب الله دعاهم وبهم يمطرح الارض انه يكون من الاولياء المخصوصين ومن الابدال الصالحين ليس انسانا عاديا مخصوصا باستجابه الدعاء من الله سبحانه وتعالى. And if you want to know the explanation of what that means, a person's du'a is always answered, you become one of the awliya. That's what that means. If you if you're constantly Allah's answering your du'a, you become of this archetype, someone that's illuminated where if you call upon Allah your du'a is answered. And, and through this archetype of person that you you become by of the, the, the through them the rains fall. And what this means it, it means uh, Physically, but it's also figurative, or it's matnawi, it's metaphysical. That the spiritual rains and blessings, you become a source to unlock these things upon the Ummah and everyone on earth. <laughs> مثل الغاز مثل البترول كذا مواد مشتعلة والبيت حبه ملان فدعا الحبيب أحمد بن عبد الرحمن السقاف فلما كانوا أثناء الطعام قام هذا الرجل مرعوب وخايف إيش حصل قال عندنا هناك نار حريق هذا المكان كله زيوت سيلحب البيت ربما الجيران الحبيب أحمد بن عبد الرحمن قالوا لا اجلس كيف سيكون عندك حريق ونحن عندك في البيت ما دمنا عندك في البيت ما يكون أي شيء سيء أبدا جلس قال لا نار هناك فذهبوا فودوا النار قد فبهم يمطر أهل الأرض بعمر يسير استغفر الله المؤمنين والمؤمنات استغفر الله المؤمنين والمؤمنات One example of, of this archetype a person where these things happen or they become conduits where the divine mercy pours through is something that happened to the Sheikh of our, of our Shiyukh Habib the father of Habib Abdul Qadir Sagaf Habib Ahmed bin Abdul Rahman Sagaf in, in, in Sayyidun he was called out to one particular to, for, to eat one day in, in, a, in one of the neighboring houses and the person who invited him was a local businessman he was a trader he had you know these storehouses and these, um, these warehouses where he had all of his produce and whatever he was and specifically he would trade in the kind of gas cylinders which which they which they have and they use here typically so he had this entire storehouse and news reached him that the storehouse had caught on fire so he rushes in back to Habib Habib Ahmed bin Abdul Rahman al Sagaf. He's like, Habib, I've got to go. This has taken place. And he's completely, you know, beside himself. And he says, like, and Habib says, What what happened? And he said, There's, a, there's an explosion that's taken place in the storehouse. It's full of gas, it's full of oils, it's full. He goes, That's not going to happen, and I'm sat here with you. And he says, And he said, And he said, no, but Habib, you don't understand that things are exploding. He goes, I'm sitting here with you in your home now. It's not going to happen. He goes back. He goes, go and check in the house. He goes back and uh, go and check in the storehouse. He goes back and there's just this small like, flame which took place, but the whole thing was extinguished in a few moments. And nothing happened. And this is an example of those people that have cultivated their lives to be conduits of divine mercy. This can be activated or this can be this this can be uh, started upon by being becoming of these people that ask for the believing men and the women to be forgiven 27 times a day astaghfirullah lil mu'minin wa lil mu'minat subhanallah inshallah yarzuquna wa yaqum muhabbatuhum wa yaj'alna minhum wa ma'hum wa fihim inshallah so we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that allah makes us of that archetype of people and he brings us amongst them and connected to them If anybody has any questions, um, Habib Qadim, just as a reminder, Habib Qadim will be traveling in the next few days. This is, this is most likely our last opportunity. So, good on Take the opportunity. وأحسن الانتقال إلى بلدان شيوخنا لقر يعني لمجاورتهم أو نرجع إلى الغرب مثلا لكي نبلغ الدعوة المحمدية. نعم. So the question is, is asking Habib does he think that it's best that we move move near to our shiuch, we come closer to their lands and we, we take a residency where they live, 
or that we do go back to the west or anywhere else and perform the da'wah. So Habib said the prophetic call, the da'wah, the Prophet is one of the most formless and the most important of religious obligations. And anybody that travels anywhere, specifically now we're talking about the West, even if it's just for a visit, even if it's a trip, even if it's for a holiday, even if it's some kind of medical uh, purposes, you should hold in your heart care for these people and the concern and the intention to call to call them the hand the concern for the da'wah. So the different ways of giving da'wah, the conveyance of the prophetic call, isn't just merely reduced to speech but anything which is combined and rooted with a sincere intention that it can, it can be da'wah and there are different expressions of this there's da'wah in your actions there's da'wah even in your hal, your very state of being a person may be praying and in a deep state of presence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah causes it that somebody looking at that person even if you're not, you're not doing it intentionally to show other people but Allah causes somebody to look at that person and they're so affected and moved by that state of presence, it can have an effect on that person. It's transformative and brings them close to Allah or brings them to Islam. Habib Qadim said, and another example is, for example, like the likes of our sisters, in wearing a hijab, if it's worn with the correct intention, it's connected to Senate and so on and so forth, that this can have a transformative effect upon a person looking. The people will look with intrigue and they'll look with curiosity and it can have a powerful effect. And these are one of the examples. And to this meaning that our shuk they say, the, 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 the da'wah, the calling, the summoning back to Allah in one's had, one, one's, one's inner state can be more transformative and more effective than the, than the calling of just one of mere words and speech. So we've got to understand that everybody has the capacity to be somebody who is calling to Allah a da'i. Every single person. A doctor with the right intention can be a da'i. Somebody that's involved in their profession, whatever it may be, the spectrum is vast and broad. But not everybody necessarily can be a mufti. Somebody that's received authorization to, to give religious edicts and religious fatwas. This is something which is a specialization within the broader spectrum of sacred knowledge. However, every single one of us, through carrying this care and being connected to the Senate, can be a da'i and somebody that summons and calls back to presence and connection to one of the examples of this is the teacher of our teachers of our teachers. Habib Umar bin Ahmed bin Abu Bakr bin Sameh who, to, who resided in East Africa and Zanzibar and the Comoros Islands. That he was a mufti, he was a qadi in fact, he was the judge of that land. But he would very rarely speak, he would hardly ever speak and he would very rarely teach but the nature of his spiritual state was so profound that people would take their shahada, they would come up to him and just look at him, enter into his presence, be so transformed by his spiritual state, they would become Muslim this is an example of that reality <laughs> So 
فنظروا في العلماء وجادلوه فلم يكن عبدا صار يشكك على العوام ويخرج ما جالس ويتكلم بهذا حتى شكوه الى الحبيب عمر بن صمت هذا او لابد يا حبيب هذا تعمل معه حل تدعو الله عليه حتى يخرج من البلاد او تعمل له اي شيء فنحن هذا صار الان ينشر الشر. So one in one particular example that it was at the time where there was a kind of inundation of various other ideologies and 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 and, uh, and thoughts that the one one man was so affected he apostated and actually became like one of the great like major ambassadors for atheism was in the region and the scholars spoke to him they debated with him they had these you know, these long extensive debates no effect whatsoever they went back to Habib Umar bin Sumayt and they said Habib you gotta you gotta find a solution for us either you raise your hands you make dua that Allah just rids us of this challenge of this fitna or you, you give us another solution because this man's having a negative effect on, upon the society. So this man got news that people were having a word with Habib Umar bin Sumayt behind his back. He said, who's this uh, Umar bin Sumayt? I'm going to go to him and I'll debate him just like any one of you. I'm ready. Just just you arrange the meeting. So, one particular time it took place that Habib Umar bin Sumayt, you know, had this this gathering and they said to the man, look, he's here, you come. When he attended the gathering, the people on the other side were like, saying to Habib Umar bin Sumayt, that's the guy, he's the one doing all, making all the problems, causing all the disturbance. So he looked over at him and the man saw him, they met eyes and the man anticipated that because Habib Umar was also the Qali, he was the chief judge of the entire region, somebody with a vast amount of knowledge both inwardly and outwardly. His, his anticipate, what he was anticipating is that Habib Umar bin Sumayt is now going to go into deep kind of polemical debate and engage with him. He did nothing of the sort. He looked over at him, smiled at him, greeted him, asked him to come close to him, and just had beautiful character with the man. And the man was kind of like caught off guard. He wasn't expecting this kind of interaction. so things that Habib Umar bin Sumayt's uh, way of being with this man was so, was so at ease that the man just was kind of like what's going on like maybe he doesn't know who, who I am or what, what, what I've been doing he just dealt with him gently and he asked how he was doing it was just as if they were friends it was, it was the assumption is that as if they were, fr- they were friends he didn't say anything to refute he didn't even mention the topic a few things um, transpired in the gathering there's the exchanges how people just like niceties and then all of a sudden have you remember in Sumayt he pointed to one of the munshids the people reciting the Qasida he said just sing for us so he's the, the, the munshid started to sing and it's one of the well-known Qasidas uh, poems of, of the great Imam al-Haddad Naseem Hajar, Naseem Hajar it, it's like this lament calling upon the, the, the breeze from this far away land and he talks about the various parts of Medina is, do you have any news that will cause my heart to be cured and settled because choked, like I'm yearning to hear about it, it's this incredible long 
Qasidan towards the end of it, he says, Allahu Akbar hadihim al-Hagiga, Allahu Akbar, this is the reality. And he talks about, it's, you know, it's a very beautiful Qasida talking about the different parts of yearning for Medina Munawwara, yearning for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This, the Qasida was sung. All of a sudden, Habib Umar bin Sumayt, you know, as is the tradition here, is they recite the Fatiha and it all, everyone disperses. A few people that called and arranged the things, they go, Habib Umar, what's going on? This isn't what we wanted. We wanted a debate with this is the guy that we've been telling you about. All the little plays you hear who's singing songs. Habib Umar said, don't worry about it. They looked outside and the man was like, had his, his head in his arms with tears streaming from his eyes. And they're like, what's up with you? And he said, I don't know what took place in that gathering, but when Habib Umar told people to recite that qasida and he recited that dua, something took place. I've made tawbah. I go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A light entered into my heart. First, I'm going to forget everything which took place before that. We'll come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He grants us and you great openings. So the primary thing that every single one of us should never neglect is to have that care and concern within our hearts. After that, you see circumstantially what's most appropriate in terms of speech, in terms of action, and so on and so forth, but we should have that, cultivate that care and concern in our hearts for da'wah. Does anyone of the brothers have a question? So, in terms of the verses that Habib mentioned, we'll get them sent out in the groups, inshallah. Yeah, two verses. Does anyone have any questions? Last opportunity, people. Bismillah. No regrets. Um, please raise your voice if you can. Uh, I have a question. Fadal. Like, um, what do you do in terms of, like, if, if your community doesn't have a spiritual guide and, um, and you're looking, and that's one of the ways to protect yourself from trials and tribulation, what does one do in order to protect themselves during that? الأخ سيدنا نيوزيلندا ويسأل ماذا نعمل إذا فقدنا الشيوخ في بلداننا ليس لنا من تربط بها في واقع الأرض الواقع ماذا نعمل نحن في مثل في مثل الأرض بعيد عن الناس ممكن يعوض هذا قراءة كتب الشيوخ وقراءة أوراد الشيوخ والصالحين هذا يعطي نوع تعويض لمن تعلق بهم ولمن قرأها so Habib said in response to those people that find uh, that they're far away from spiritual guides and the shiuch and they don't have this ability to kind of frequent their gatherings with consistency, Habib said the solution to that, the, the beginning solution, is to make sure that you have a, a, you're attentive to reading their books. <laughs> And some of the books which are written by these spiritual guys have such a potency that it actually replicates something of sitting in their physical company. Because we have to understand the whole point of sitting in the physical company of the shiukh is, isn't just the outward act. But rather, it's so that on a spiritual level, we're able to con uh, connect. The hearts are connected, and this can take place if we're connected, even if we're in the most distant place. And this tran uh, transformation and illumination can take place in one's inward heart, in spite of their physical distance by reading the likes of the Ihya al din the revival of the religious science. So they say the likes of these books, they're so spiritual in, in, in what 
was enfolded in the reality that reciting or reading through them, meditating upon them, it's like a shaykh for the one that has no shaykh. But what, what about the person that does have a shaykh, even if they're in a faraway land, but they do use as a means to come close to them, you know, they access these books and they meditate and contemplate. <laughs> كتاب بداية الهداية قراءة مثل كتاب الطبقات الكبرى الإمام الشعراني هذا مجرب إذا قرأه الإنسان يحصل عنده انبعاث اسمه الباعث ونشاط حتى إذا كان كسلان لا يريد أن يقوم آخر ليل يريد أن يصلي عتر عندما يقرأ الكتب هذا ينبعث حتى إذا كان كسلان لا يريد أن يقرأ الأذكار والأوراد وصلطت عليه بعض الظروف كسلان لا عنده رغبة أن يقرأ الأذكار والأوراد عندما يقرأ هذه الكتب تأتيه هذه الدوافع النورانية ينشط إلى قيام الليل ينشط إلى العلم ينشط إلى الخير ينشط إلى أعمال البر يقرأت مثل هذه الكتب مجربة إحياء علوم الدين طبقات الكبرى العارف الشعراني بعض كتب الإمام الحداد حتى كتاب بداية الهداية الصغير الإمام الغزالي مجرب فيحصل الغرض من وجود الشيخ أن يعلمك وينورك ويحصل البركة والانبعاث فقراءة هذه الكتب ملآنة بالشحنات النورانية التي تجعل الإنسان ينتظر ما شاء الله لأعمال الخير حتى وأن كان كسلانا So Habib said that in a portion is kind of like daily routine this schedule of recitation as a spiritual practice it has an effect of connecting people and illuminating the heart awakening the soul particularly certain books the likes of which we mentioned the Ihya of Imam al-Ghazali, the revival, the likes of the, uh, the, the stories of the awliya by Imam uh, Sha'arani, some of the books of Imam, many of the books of Imam al-Haddad, for example. Habib said, even the likes of Bidayat al-Hidayat, the beginning of guidance by Imam al-Ghazali, which ostensibly is a very concise, it's a short book, it's not one of the major works in, to solve, but because of the nature of the soul that wrote it, it has a spiritual potency that you can derive from. And this has an effect in one's spiritual <laughs> practice. If you become lazy in, for example, the, 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 the practice of waking up for, the, for tahajjud, this has an effect, it energizes you. It has a, a, a mystical effect where it <coughs> causes you to gain this, regain the spiritual himma and the spiritual energy. If, for example, you become complacent, complacent or neglectful in reading your, your dhikr, your daily adhkar, this has an effect in spiritually of just kind of... Um, giving this boost to so these particular to have a, a, as a spiritual practice with consistently to read the books of the awliya and the salihin so even if you you don't understand the arabic language habib said that the translated works of these books it, it indicates to the, to the meanings which were meant, and it's enough of a conduit for that light to flow. Okay. <laughs> نعم أشياء من أجل الدعوة أو من أجل نعم 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 You have to have knowledge to give da'wah. So Habib said in response, um, and the question, simply put, forgive me the framing, please let me know if it's not complete, but do you have to have knowledge or a basis of knowledge in order to be a da'i and to call to Allah? And Habib said that the da'wah in its broadest sense is a very different state, different stages, and, and it's the best spectrum of what we're talking about. Well, adal daraja min daraja al da'wah ma yagulu al Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam sallam wa nusuh li kull muslim. So one of the particular stages or phases of da'wah is just sincere advice to every every muslim. Wa hadi mumkin takun bil tadkir la tahtaj ila ayy ilm. 
And this can be just sort of like a gentle reminder. You don't necessarily need, it doesn't need to be predicated on that. So for example, like just a reminder to go and visit someone if they're sick or you know, to, to be present in a janaza prayer, so on and so forth. It doesn't really need like a, a deep no- knowledge in order to do this. You're connecting people, signposting people back to different forms of expressions of goodness. Or for example, if you see somebody going down a, a, a bad path, just to kind of gently warn them or gently encourage them to move away from that, that doesn't necessarily mean like a curse. And to be silent if somebody is doing something wrong, it's more dangerous than just calling people to, to good things. Because if somebody falls into a disarray and some kind of real, like something erroneous within in the context of the religion, it's going to take an active response for you to do. If they don't do much amount of, many, much amount of good works, that's one thing, but if somebody's like literally in danger in terms of their religion, doing something seriously wrong, then the danger is... And that's so as Imam al-Ghazali mentions, he said if, if somebody's lying down or on the side of the room and you see that they've got like a scorpion or a snake, some kind of poisonous insect crawling up their back, you're not going to say, oh, I feel shy about letting them know, oh, maybe they're not going to accept my advice. You, you go up to the person, obviously with tact and wisdom, but you say, look, this is going to kill you potentially, it's going to sting you, it's going to harm you. Similarly with, with religion, but it's, it's no excuse, but you do it with a tap, tap, you know, tactful way and in a way which is wise. This doesn't require a deep, you can kind of like, um, foundation of knowledge, because this is more like in the, in the realms of like a reminder, a gentle reminder. Now, that's one example, and it's one of the, not the lowest, but you can say one of the most foundational um, stages of Dawah. The next stage, or that which requi- does require knowledge, is if your channel of Dawah is going to be in, for example, serving people in, in the realms of Fiqh. If you don't know the Halal and the Haram and the nuances and the, the, the rulings, then you're not going to be able to do that like, without any, any grounding and knowledge. You're going to have to learn this. And if that's your particular channel for Dawah, then you can call to Allah and bring people back into presence, back into dhikr, through um, the knowledge of fiqh and so on and so forth. نعم وكما قال شيخنا الحبيب عمر حفظه الله كذلك حتى في طريقة الدعوة تختلف على اختلاف الحالة مثلا إذا رأيت يعني أفعى كبيرة في بيت إنسان وفي غرفته ليست كما يعني ترى حشرة لا تعرف ما هي فإذا تقول ما في حاجة خطيرة في أفعى كبيرة فقط في البيت هنا أنت بيت. لكن هذا يحتاج إلى تنبيه انتبه هذا شيء خطير وكبير فكل واحد تعطيه على حسب الحالة في الدعوة إلى قلت لك يعني حتى طريقة الدعوة على حسب الحالة التي يكون فيها الإنسان فإذا فرضنا رأيت أفعى كبيرة وخطيرة في بيت إنسان وفي حجرته فلا بد أن يكون طريقة التنبيه تدل على خطورة هذا الأمر وليس يعني بصيغة خفيفة تقول ما في حاجة خطر ولا في شيء في أفعى كبيرة في الغرفة حقك إنه يرى بخلاف لو كانت حاجة خفيفة تعطي تص يعني تنصح في الحالة على حسبها لا يكبرها ولا يستقصر استقصرها so for example, everything has to be, a, uh, you shouldn't do things which are disproportionate. So if somebody does like a little crawly insect that's, that's harmful, that's not poisonous, you're not going to come in screaming and shouting like, get out and frighten the person. Similarly, if there's a poisonous deadly snake in a room, everything has to be in a portion. Like, you need to like watch out, you're going to die. You know, everything has to be done, you know, proportionately, everything has to be done in the right way with wisdom and tax, everything with its band. Alaikum Salaam Alaikum 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 Alaikum
how do we um, cultivate this love? Or if the love is present, how do we make sure it's a pure love? Or how do we increase the love? ذكرتم سيدي أن لابد أن ننمي قراءة الخير الآخرين والهم حتى المحبة لإنقاذهم من الجنة لكن ما هي الخطوات التطبيقية حتى ننمي هذا في بواطن نعم هو أول الخطوات التطبيقية في هذا الدعاء للمسلمين والمسلمات المؤمنين والمؤمنات بأن الله يصلح أحوالهم أن الله يشفي مرضاهم أن الله يزيد أنوارهم أن الله يسعد قلوبهم ويفرح قلوبهم ويجعلهم دائما فرحانين المسلمين مسرورين أن الله يبعد عنهم كل ما يذيهم الاستمرار في مثل هذه الدعوات حتى وإن كان في البداية بمجرد الكلمات والألفاظ لكن على الاستمرار يولد الهم الحقيقي ويولد الحال وأيضا صحبه يرتقي مراقي كثيرة وسريعة من الله سبحانه وتعالى The first practical method of cultivating that, that love and care and concern for people is to pray for them to actively set aside a period of time and make dua for them for the believing man, the believing women, the entirety of the ummah literally to, go, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide them Habib said even at the beginning it's just lip service the beginning is just you don't really feel that care or concern but, you know, it's that after a period of time you're going to start to be concerned because Allah is going to show to you certain things and because if, you're, if you're continuous upon this it will start to cultivate love in the heart تمام انظر كيف الدعوات يفرح قلوبهم يجعلهم دائما مسرورين يحفظ ديانهم يحفظ اي امر يشوش عليهم الدعاء يولد بعد ذلك حال so when you consistently ask Allah Allah guide them Allah grant them ease Allah you know assist them in all of their affairs you can't continue doing that other than it's going to produce a, a state in the heart of care you're going to have it's going to affect that, that, that practice is going to affect the heart. كان أحد الدعاء إلى الله في مدينة سيون قبل مئتين سنة وهذا واحد من آلاف الدعاء إلى الله في مدينة سيون وكانت صغيرة مدينة سيون ليست كبيرة وكان لا ينام هذا الدعاء إلى الله والفقيه حتى يرى أن أهل سيون كلهم نيام ولا أحد عندهم مريض ولا أحد عنده هم ولا أحد عنده غم هو ينام آخر واحد ينام يطلع فوق السطح كل آل بلاد تمام هو ينام إذا أي مشكلة عند أحد أو أي تشويش في بيت أحد أو أي شيء في بيت أحد لا ينام حتى يحل ذلك الأمر يحب أهل البلد وهذا كناء عنه يحب المسلمين كلهم. One of the examples of this is one of the great scholars in the in the in the town of Sayun and and this was a long time ago during this time Sayun was a small small town that he would not sleep other than he would uh, find out that everybody in the town was, was okay. If they needed anything, he wouldn't be able to sleep. Even in terms of praying for them, if somebody had passed away, he would allocate this time to pray for them and so on and so forth. So that, and this is one of the examples of this practice in, in praying for people. وكان إذا مات حد من أهل سيئون لا يهدى أبدا يأمر طلبته وتلامذته اقرأوا القرآن لهذا الميت حتى لا يعرفه اقرأوا ألف من سورة الإخلاص اقرأوا ألف من سورة من سبحان الله وبحمده يقرأوا له الألوف حتى يرون الميت في المنام أو يرون الميت في المنام فإذا آه حد رأى رؤيا فيقول حد من عم البارح هذا الميت أنا رأيته ما شاء الله في الثياب الخبر في الجنة والحمد لله الآن خلاص تمام خلاص فلا يهدى حتى تظهر رؤيا مبشرة حسنة صالحة لمن مات ولا يستمرون فيه يقول هذا قد يكون عنده تقصير ونحن لا نعرف وقد يكون على إحساب ونحن لا ندري لابد من الآن أن نعاونه نقرأ له سورة الأخلاص نقرأ التسبيحات حتى يكون قبر رضا من رياض الجنة فإذا ظهرت المبشرات أطمأن في هذه الحالة To such an extent that this one particular Habib would uh, call his students and his disciples to pray for somebody of the deceased and he would tell them specific things, read such and such an amount of Surah Al-Fatiha, donate it to them, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, causes its light and its nur and its blessing to be a source of, you know, ease for them in the grave, Surah Al-Ikhlas, so on and so forth, to such an extent that he wouldn't sleep until one of his students would actually see the person in a dream, which would be some kind of indication that the person was okay and everything was taken care of, and this is a very deep and profound spiritual kind of uh, station where the person he would not sleep and wouldn't rest until he saw a dream that the person that just deceased was in a good state and in fact entered into Jannah. Thank you.
وبسرعه الى الله ادعاء للناس عندما يدعو المسلمين حتى في الجلسات العامه وفي الزيارات عندما تدعو انت المسلمين الله يعطيك حوائجك لانك انت تدعو لغيرك وبسرعه تتقرب الى الله. So not only does this have an effect in the continual perpetual making dua for all people of creating a, a deep prophetic care and concern and love in the heart for those people but there are other effects also and one of the most profound of which is everything that you ask for in reality you're also asking for yourself so if you ask for these things for other people that you're actually also asking and these things are it's a means for those to us to be to be answered for yourself so you're a bit hot right now هم يعني كان مشتاقين إنهم يتلو اسمعهم وعرف أنكم إشراف السفر. نعم. يشكرون لكم يعني. نعم. You're saying that every single one of them we know of various things. Everyone's been so keen to sit with Sayyid Al-Hayyub Khan, and we know that he's close to traveling, so we just wanted to thank him for his time, and he just came outside of his schedule to be with you all. So. إن شاء الله الله قل إن شاء الله ما قلتوه نتسمعه النوم لا سبحانه وتعالى. Because everything that you've asked for, Allah has heard. إن شاء الله. إن شاء الله. ربنا إن شاء الله يحقق ذلك وفوق ذلك. May Allah cause that to be realized and that which is beyond that which you've asked. وبلغنا أمانينا وفوق أمانينا سبحانه وتعالى. We ask Allah that Allah allows us to reach all of our hopes and beyond our hopes and dreams. And that which relates to ourselves and our loved ones and our friends and family and all of our dear uh, brothers and sisters. And, and as Allah has gathered us all in this, these blessed lands and, and in Tareem we ask Allah that Allah similarly gathers and gathers us in the highest abodes of Jannah. And the believers in paradise, they reminisce about their days in the dunya, that, yeah, I remember that day when we were sat in class and we asked this question and this happened. May Allah give us the ability, the tawfiq, in this short, brief uh, life, that we're able to give victory to the Prophet <laughs> and the desires that the Prophet has in regards to his <laughs> The Prophet ﷺ, what does he want for his ummah? He wants them to be all happy. He wants them all to be constantly ascending, constantly you know, deepening in their conscience. That's what the Prophet says amongst the shayateen that cause these shadows and darknesses to pervade amongst us. They don't want that. And that's why they call, they're the source of these veils. They don't want that for them. What we want is what the Prophet says. And the Prophet says, what does he want from the Ummah? He wants everyone from the Ummah, all of the Muslims to be together and to love and respect and honor each other. Shia from the one and they want people to hate on each other, they cause dispute, they cause fighting. So we don't want to be with the shaitan, we want to be with the Prophet and that which he wants. Yeah. 
برحلتكم هذه لا تنسوا ان اكمل الانتفاع تعود لكم العوائد تفصل لكم الموائد تجمع لكم الفوائد من جميع الجهات في جميع الحالات ان شاء الله وتبلغون اعمالكم كلها الدنيويه والاخرويه مع كمال عوافي الظاهره والخفيه ومع كمال تيسير الامور حسا ومعنى في زياده لكم في الايمان واليقين وفتح ابواب المحبه والمعرفه والنصر لسيد المرسلين لكم ولاهاليكم ولقرباتكم ان شاء الله يجعل كل واحد اسباب للهدايات وللتلقيات على اهاليه وقاربه وجيرانه ومن يلقاه اسباب للهدايات وللسعادات في خيرات راقين في مراقي المحبه والمعرفه والعبوديه والنصره للرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم وحسن الخواتيم والمرافقه له في درجات الجنان ويرحم موتانا خاصه موتى المسلمين المتقدمين في كريم وعلى نيات سيدنا وشيخنا الحبيب عمر شر اسرار الفاتحه والى حضره النبي. اللهم صل وسلم. فاتحه.